welcome wherever you are around the world. Grab a cocktail because you're in for an amazing show. We're back for our third uh, show in the series of A Journey of a Lifetime where we have celebrated the great man, Freddie French, and his incredible son, Nicholas French. So start sending out that love and start sending out the messages to your friends to join us today because it's going to be a really great show. It's been so fascinating studying the path and the history of Freddie French from his humble beginnings to building an empire to the incredible looks that he created, how he trained and helped Nicholas climb the ladder and then Nicholas flew by himself to create the most incredible iconic images and have such an incredible, did I say incredible? I mean incredible career. So we're going to continue our journey today by exploring the 1960s and the 70s. And it's amazing how the 20s was an influence to the 60s, the Bob. And it's amazing how today we're still dipping into the past to get great ideas for the present. So Nicholas and I really do believe that history is a great teacher. So how many of you love retro? You do? You love it? Well, today you're going to get tons of ideas because we're going to show you, demonstrate some hair ideas. We've got some show and tell and some amazing movies that I put together to dip into the past and really feel what it was like to be a hairdresser in that time. And I know that you're gonna get some great tips and tricks along the way. So are you ready? All right, so let's take a dive into the 60s and the 70s. Everything about the 60s was bold, brash, designed to shock. The main influence was no longer from the movie screens or governed by social restrictions. Young fashion designers took their inspiration from popular music. The Beatles and Rolling Stones outraged the sensibilities of the older generation, but completely transfixed a powerful generation of trendsetters. Pop stars amplified fashion sensations and vocalized the spirit of rebellion, calling on a younger generation to run wild. Mary Quant and Vidal Sassoon teamed up to create the mod look, creating the biggest revolution in hair during modern times. Vidal Sassoon transformed the entire business with his geometric cuts and wash and wear styles, liberating women from rollers and back home bouffants. Barbershops still locked into traditional cuts did not survive the long hair boom, and in their place the unisex salon arrived. This revolutionary new form of design was the catalyst for change and the death of the old beauty parlor. The stage was set for street trends to dominate and influence the runways. Never before in history had fashion come from the street. The tide had turned, paving the way for the next big revolution. Another significant and entirely British phenomenon was punk, which still influences fashion today. Punk was a socially and politically motivated anti-fashion, slashed, ripped, pierced. This nightmarish style was born from a nation with rising unemployment and social unrest. Anarchy was their style, expressed most strongly in hair. From the 70s until today, we have been dipping into the past for inspiration with a resurgence of retro. Fashion moves in circles where timing is everything. The clever designer is the one who can mask where the inspiration came from, avoiding the obvious, injecting new life into the past, proving that great classics do withstand the passage of time. Never forget that history is our greatest teacher as the past indirectly influences the future. We should always be grateful to the Grand Masters for their creative and technical skills that we have the potential to inherit today. Isn't that the coolest footage? Don't you just love the way that she was powdering 
her face with that little machine. Totally cool. So again, we can get some great ideas from the past. So let's bring on our dear friend, Nicholas French, who is my rock star. Welcome, Nick. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this uh, madness. You know, everything came from the 60s and the 70s. Um, and I think the, the great thing, uh, Viv, is that yeah, uniformity had sort of gone um, and individuality became a reality because then everybody had their individual sort of looks, their feelings, their moods. Whereas that the 50s was very much, you know, hoop dresses, white gloves, and the same silhouette. In the late 60s, it all started to change very, very aggressively. It was like a real sort of um, renaissance, if you will, um, to the future. And everything really comes from that period, which I think was great. And, um, you know, I started, I left school at 65, not 1865, 1965. <laughs> it's and um, I went straight to my dad's as an apprentice. Then very shortly afterwards, I walked around the corner with some drawings and went to the Dowsons in Bond Street. He said, I can't do hair, but this is the shapes I love. And I think it's really cool what you're doing. That's, that was when I sort of birthed my individuality, if you will, you know? Yeah. Moving forward and so my freedom. So before we jump into the future, I'd love to now just explore a little bit about the past, but I'd love to know, what was one of the cool dances that you did in the 60s? Oh my goodness, I mean, it was all rock and roll really, and um, it was all <laughs> rock and roll. Then you did the twist, which was really cool, you know. But you have to understand, it was, um, the face was, in the reflection was somewhat different, so I had sort of brown hair with a fringe, it was really long. You know, I was about a foot taller and about 50 pounds thinner, I think. And, um, you know, it, it was a very exciting period. It was a revolution. It was really a revolution, you know, uh, against everything, you know, uh, you know, against sort of like we were pushed into this kind of very straight thing. And then after that, we really moved forward. And, um, you know, my dad was aware of that. And, um, you know, but this, this revolution really hurt his business at the end of the day. So talk to us a little bit about where we've been and where we're going to go now. So what are we seeing here? Uh, what we're seeing here is well, dad, my mum and dad on the right there. This is a sort of wonderful pictures. And, and dad always believed in making shampoo for each of his clients. So this is just a spoof when he's cracking an egg over a client's head. But in reality, they actually did a recipe each client and they actually made shampoo in a machine uh, at the backwash, you know, we wash all the hair. Um, for each client, you know, so if they had sort of greasy hair or something, they would have a special, you know, formula for that or very thick and coarse, there's a formula for that. Um, it's very cool. And these two pictures here are very indicative of what Dad did. When he did photographs, they're very much like artwork. He didn't really stick to a trend. It was more sort of, you know, hairdressing out of this world, if you will. So people were inspired to come back into the salon because it looked like a creative experience. I love. And talk to me about this, because this has a geometry and yet it's styled hair. This is beautiful. And, you know, Dad was very much a sort of diagonal of, of hairdressing in those days, but he really experimented with different things. Um, and th this was really cool. Great photographer, John Cole, uh, he worked with as a collaborator for about 25 years. And he, he was a wonderful lighter of hair. And Dad just did very simple things with hair to create bows and to roll the hair up and to do different shapes. He's always seeking something very new, something very fresh. Um, individuality was his real thing, you know, he had great hands. And here on the salons were beautiful. They're all red, black, and white. Uh, the salon on the left is in Curzon Place, which overlooks Hyde Park, actually. So the clients sat out on, you know, with hood dryers on, on the balcony. You can see Dad working on the right, uh, very much into the sort of 70s, 60s sort of, aftermath there which is really cool and he did everything very um freehand he didn't do anything with you know huge preconception if you will in, in the 60s and you know i was at the in 66 67 so i was very much in that kind of ilk you know um and it was a crossover vivian because you know i i've seen vidal back home hair you know he he will stay if he was alive today no i didn't yes he did and he used the Denman brush as well. And then you could see the transition into the six iconic haircuts from the Nancy Kwan into, 
you know, I mean, I, I was there when Mia Farrow walks into the salon and she'd had an argument with Frank Sinatra and cut lumps of hair out of her head, okay? And um, because, you know, she, she was amazing, but she's in that era, you know, she weighed about 90 pounds, very thin and very intense. And um, in fact, I was sent out to get eyelash stickers so we could stick hair into a scalp just to keep it. It was like a bob length. Yeah. Now, just before Vidal phoned up Roman Polanski, he said, you know, I've cut, in the end, he cut Mia's hair short. And he said, don't worry, there's always something to cut. Roman Polanski said, Vidal, there is always something extra to cut. Come to Hollywood, we'll make a big deal of it in the boxing ring for, you know, Roman Polanski's film, Rosemary's Baby. So all kinds of crazy things were happening like that. But the, the, the most amazing thing was that it was six haircuts, basically. So when you went to a party and you saw all these different girls, you said, well, oh, that's a Vidal Sassoon haircut. That's a Vidal Sassoon haircut. It was very sort of, you know, news breaking. And I think that was fantastic. And, and then moving forwards, you know, um, they tried different things to loosen it up. And then we get into the 70s, which is very different kinds of people. Like the mother, mum had the traditional sort of, you know, petals in her hair and very sort of stylized hair in the early 70s. And then the daughter tend to have slightly more hippie-ish kind of hair, sort of very much, yeah. you know, yeah. which is nature in the program. I've got some examples of it. Um, and I remember having a girlfriend then, and she was very uh, ar from aristocracy. Um, and uh, I cut all her hair off, very short, like the mirror, and uh, bought her a... a an electric green faux fur jacket and silver pants and platform boots. And we went to a party and her mother absolutely died when she saw her. You know, <laughs> mother had to have Countess before a name. And I suddenly said, what have you done to my daughter? Now, you know, it's a difficult question to ask, answer really in public, but. Great story, Nick. So let's now look at our film from the 60s where we see this revolution taking place. It's goodbye to the big bouffants and the sets, and it's hello to the wash and wear and the geometric haircuts. In fact, it's the death of one empire and the birth of another. Brighton, from a hair raising sport to a hair styling show. Eurocoiffure 67, they called it, and it proved a magnet for some of Britain and the continent's top mop manipulators. They'd all gathered at the seaside to make public their crowning glory creations at a time when female fashions guide the male eye to everywhere but the head. So there's plenty of room at the top to refocus eyes from dresses to tresses. It's almost pure art the way hairdressers like Vidal Sassoon produce new styles. He, of course, is a world leader in this field. But every other exhibitor at the Coiffeur Convention was out to show that they too had some heady ideas, both for themselves and their model. But there are some people who are never satisfied. While Samson could really use a touch more on top, the Delilah trend these days is ridiculous. A hairpiece for him covers up those wide open spaces. For her, it's nothing more than an instant hairdo. It's the same old story. The more you got, the more you want. What an amazing film that was. So, Nicholas, how did your father handle this revolution? Uh, with great, the, the, the change was great, with great difficulty because um, if you imagine, uh, when I worked in my dad's salon, the client came in approximately three times a week, okay? You know, she, she, she might have had a perm or a haircut or something, then she'd come back to have it combed out for an evening event. And then, you know, I used to set hair pieces to send to their country homes for their weekends, okay? So you had that very close relationship with the client because she came into the salon as an experience three or four times a week. So when Vidal really developed, um, you know, and Raymond does, did as well. I mean, Vidal really got it from Raymond. He did... You know, the geometric cutting really came from there with the tiny scissors. Um, and then he really developed it up. And the, the, the great thing was publicity. And, and John Addy did my dad's publicity for 10 years. And then Vidal talked him into doing Vidal's publicity. So this wash and wear sort of look 
uh, was made very, very prevalent. And what, that hap what happened was, the transition was, instead of three times, two times a week, the client not come in for eight weeks, all she needed was a cut and a blow dry. So that was a huge, does that make sense? That was a huge difference yeah. to my dad's 27 salons. So he was really only had the mothers left, if you will, to do their hair. Um, and the daughters were really seeking, you know, the 60s look, which is sort of mini skirts and, um, you know, and, and all that kind of, you know, that different kind of silhouette and short hair, fresh looking hair that swung around and it moved, you know, hair moved. Whereas traditionally, all these other ladies, you know, unless they're aristocracy, uh, would, would go to my dad's salon. So he, he basically lost about a third of his clients or more overnight. So it was a very difficult thing to handle. And, um, you know, he had a hairdresser that came in, did, you know, haircuts that had a geometric feel to it and, and whatever. But at the same time, he was never, he was never as strong as what everybody else did. And he was always, he went a bit in the wrong direction. So that's basically how at the end of the day, he lost his business in the 70s um, and he lost everything. It's terrible. And, wow. you know, he'd done so much early on to change the world of hairdressing and then they sort of lost the plot with this wash and wear thing that was going on. Although Dad actually, actually invented it originally, but he never really developed it in the haircutting terms um, in his sound. It was a technique that didn't really um, parallel to what Vidal was doing at the time. So Nick, there's a huge story here for us all to learn from about being relevant and staying with the times to have the courage to reinvent oneself. So let's hear from the man himself. This is a clip from my film series, I'm Not Just a Hairdresser. And let's hear about Vidal Sassoon telling his story, taking over from where Freddie French left off. From 54 to 63 was dynamite because we could, it was slow. We'd finish the clients about 5.30, go for, go for a break, have some early dinner, come back and work on models. It became our hobby. It was something that we had to do. And I say we because I was training a team and they were with me. Uh, eventually wonderful people like Roger Thompson and Christopher Booker came, but they weren't there in those very, very early days. I wouldn't tease, I wouldn't back comb. People would say, but this is the way I want it. I'll make a phone call. I have very good friends who do that kind of work, and I'll get you a cab. But I wouldn't compromise. Most of it comes from that sense of gut and you're cutting shapes and angles and suddenly things started to happen. But it took nine years before we got into that full geometric, before we came out with the five point cut and, and the Nancy Quam Bob. Suddenly the kids had cash. They were owning it and they wanted to create their look. takes a bone structure, a face, and with the substance growing from that face, cuts and shapes and does, creates angles, or curl, or whatever. And the whole essence with color, very often with perm, but definitely with cut. You create something where you see that glint in that person's eye, and you know you've changed something in their life for them, for that moment. I mean, you're not a psychiatrist, you haven't changed their life, but you've done something for them that's made them terribly happy. What other art form is there where you can work one-on-one -on -one with another human being and create something for them that gives you so much pleasure? 
A powerful message from a great man who's shaped contemporary hairdressing. I'm now going to show you a technique of a cute little bob that is inspired from the 60s, taking it into today's sensibility using the scissor and the razor. I hope you enjoy it. Let's explore a 1960s inspired hairstyle based on a geometric shape and a bob. Cutting a V shape in the nape of the neck and then removing any hair that does not lie within this actual strong triangle shape. So while the outside has the triangle, and you can see here I'm graduating the weight line I just put into the shape, the interior of this hairstyle actually is square. So you have a triangle that graduates up to meet squareness. You can see here I'm holding my fingers horizontal to build the weight of the bob, being mindful as to where this line is going to end. And we're going to go underneath the ear, so therefore the graduation in the nape of the neck must speak to the ultimate weight line I'm going to leave at the front. Now that I've established a weight line, I'm going to bevel the weight line and continue the graduation from heavy, working through into a rounder effect. So these layers are actually rounded through from the graduation. I graduate from the back into the sides, aiming at my focal point, which you can see is just below the ear. This hairstyle is going to have a very strong bob line in the front, so I'm cutting freehand through the comb, and the comb offers me a really strong guide and as you can see, comb the hair the way it falls, cut without tension, and just glide underneath the comb. Here, connecting from my back into my side and making sure that the graduation flows through so that I have a continuous bevel. Repeating this method on my second side, and again, always having a focal point to work towards. And this hairstyle has a little bit of asymmetric feeling in the front, which makes it a whole lot of fun. And you can see here again, gliding through and aiming to the jawline. To see the long version of this hairstyle with more detail, you can visit Hair Designer TV and it lives within our designer program. So here you can see freehand cutting my asymmetric fringe. And I like to use my comb because it gives me such strength of line and control and uh, certainly better than my fingers. <laughs> so you can see here, freehand and always being sensitive to how is the hair going to fall. You can see I'm using very tiny scissors here because I want to do very fine small strokes and a larger scissor will actually get in the way. We change our tools, now I'm working with the razor. So this is where we bring a classic geometric hairstyle from the 60s into today by adding texture to a hairstyle that would not have happened back in the good old days. So by applying this texture, here you can see I'm butter knifing on the underneath to debulk the hair. And this is a wonderful way of retaining length but reducing the weight. Here you can see we've got some great texture and beautiful color. I love the uh, shadowed root area. And you can see that we have a 1960s inspired geometric shape with the texture in on the inside really makes this so fabulous and I think you'll agree and has had a great before and after. That's great, yeah. So this is like this was the traditional sort of silhouette in the sixties that you you would actually use. Very much uh, got a very high, and the hair was actually this is the sixties look. The hair was rolled forwards as opposed to backwards, which is quite interesting. So that's a point of difference. And that's you get, beautiful. You really, get this really funky sort of looks to it, and this was really the daughter. You know, if she went out somewhere special. Now I'll show you, Mum. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you can see uh, the drawing, but there was a there was a very famous 70s opera singer called Maria Callas, and uh, her hair was done by Alexander Paris most of the time, and it was absolutely stunning. In fact, this was a sort of look 
I don't know if we can see that in the camera, but this was a look that she, can you see that? Yeah, that's better. Yeah, look, that she had. And she had a very, very long nose. So that, so they had to have a suggestion of height in the front. Otherwise, it really wouldn't suit her. So I sort of replicated a, a looser version of that, which was like this. So this was a very much a 70s sort of silhouette that you would see um, in, in, in the salons, like Derek Rowe or in Leonard and kind of that kind of place. And then they had accessories. But you know, the funny thing was that if you had a really long nose, then you had to build up the volume on the top. So that gives you an idea of where mum sat in the whole, you know, in, in the whole situation. Very much okay. like really let's, hair. Let's have, let's have our friends be able to take a screen capture of that. If you could show front, side and back. This is a great time, guys, to take some photos. Yeah, okay. So this will be the, the front of the hair. And you can see that's got that height to it. That is really 70 because I worked in a salon called Derek Rowe in Knightsbridge, where you had people like Lady Keswick, the Cecils, and um, that's when I ended up doing Princess Margaret's hair for a couple of years. And it was all this kind of a thing with the tiaras going on. And then we go from the side, and you can see how even this hair is not dragged back, it's dragged down and around, which is quite rare today. You'd never see that look today. And then again at the back, it was like sort of petals of the hair, but twisted in a scallop way. Um, and quite cleanly done, so it would last the whole night. And in fact, these you would see like in the daughter's hair would be broken down in like, you know, Marrakesh and places like that. You'd see pictures of, you know, John Paul Getty's son with his girlfriend, and she'd have a hair like this, but it'd be in like a caftan, more of a caftan kind of a thing. Um, and I want to move the cameras in a minute to show you that kind of a look, because I've got some caftans in the background. You can see here in the background here, and that's oh. just loose petals. Can you see that? It's just amazing. You see, and then on the other side, I've got if I can move the camera, I don't know, you might have to edit this out a bit. If I can move the camera a bit, um, let me move the camera a bit closer to everything else. Um, I'm not getting it, hang on a minute. Um, but you see the calf down sort of look with very big puts of the hippies and stuff, and then, then the daughters really flashed out. And they set their hair in rags to get this very sort of raggy, loose look. That's beautiful. And that was set in, in rags, Vivian, or what uh, I did once in the 70s television commercial, because I did the hair for TV commercials, hundreds of them actually. And I did some punk ones as well, which I think you'll see later. Um, but when I, I remember being once in Wales on a mountain top, and I said, well, we haven't got anything to set your hair, but set it in toilet paper and we twist it and write rags and we've got this wonderful texture which is very much like what you would see um, at that period of time but in a modern fresh way because I made this asymmetric it looks quite it looks quite cool. Now so, did you do that from wet to dry milk or just damp? No I did it I did it on uh, just damp very slightly damp hair and then I just diffused it so and you can so Raggy, but that is really what we did in the early 70s. And then I worked in a salon called Molten Brown, which was everything was done with finger drying, everything was done with like rags and that kind of a feel. And that's what we went, I was there for six years, and we really developed all kinds of different looser looks, you know, from the early 71 to 76, I worked there. Then I left there, then I did my first cosmopolitan cover and the rest of it afterwards but that's that look and then we've got um which i'm going to comb out later on and get dorian off here so I, I did another set similar and i'm going to show you how to comb that out how they combed it out in those days and the look and we actually put thread in the hair we sewed thread in the hair so it's very sort of you know hippie-ish sort of feel to the hair and you can see how that will work that will work also with sort of caftans yeah. Sort of, yeah. Absolutely. So that was a sort of feeling. And it's rather exciting because there were so many different moods, so many different, in your own words, Vivian, so many different tribes. There was a sort of punk, and then there was a neo punk, and then there was a glam punk. And then you got this sort of almost like Nirvana ish hippie girls going around, um, flower power, that kind of a thing. Um, and then you got very sort of 
it's like gaps of society. And then you've got amazing sort of, there we go, look, you see the sixes and Twiggy and um, Twiggy was amazing. And Leonard did her hair and Daniel Galvin who invented tin for highlights also colored her hair. And he invented tin for highlights about 1969, which was extraordinary. And um, here on the left, this is great, because here on the left was the first cover ever of Cosmopolitan. I worked at Derek Rowe uh, in Knightsbridge, and they sent me to do their first cover of Cosmopolitan. That was Julie Crossways. You can see their hair there. Actually, they said, oh, it's too loose, it's all too untidy, but I did it anyway. So that was 1972. And then on the right-hand side were my 1976 uh, Vogue photographs for Harvey Nichols' store. And right on the right-hand side, you can see that V-shape, which was very much where the haircuts were going. And I masked her hair to get a lovely V-shape. And on the left, where the white, if you see the girl lying on the concrete, um, and that white braiding in her hair was actually the, the barrier for permanent waves. They gave you all these braids, so you buried the hairline to stop the permanent waving lotion going into the face. And I thought, ooh, that's rather exciting. I got that wonderful texture. And, um, you know, they loved it at Vogue. And this was like UK outfits for Harvey Nichols. Um, and that, that, that was sort of edgy, really. On the right was really edgy. And this is the same sort of period. Before that, like four years earlier, and that's what people were doing. So so many different things, so many different takes. Um, rather an exciting period. I think, uh, and I remember doing that Cosmopolitan cover, it was the most exciting thing I ever did. And I, I went on the subway, Viv, and because it was the first ever uh, Cosmopolitan, um, it was amazing. It was on the whole of the side of the subway, this big poster. And then guess what happened 40 years later? Um, I was invited to create the hair for the 40th anniversary of Cosmopolitan with 40 girls. Uh, at L'Oreal, actually, they did it. And I was actually invited to, to create all the hair for the 40 girls all wearing red dresses. Same deal, red background, red dresses, blonde hair. And that was rather exciting. So I, I traversed the whole, <laughs> all those eras. You're so funny, Nick. Well, before we get into demonstrating our 70s and 60s hairstyles, let's take a look at this very short film clip because how is it that this amazing Nicholas French can go from... Princess Margaret to punk. He's changed. He's got in with the wrong crowd. I don't know what he gets up to. We seem to have some sort of old over him. I mean, who are these people? John Smith's Yorkshire Bitter. Enough to lead anyone astray. So, Nicholas, did you do the dog's hair as well? Yes, I did. Because it, what it was, there's a very famous TV commercial about the little dog on the older guy, Arkwright, his name was, and the dog knew the, bar, the pub he went to, and they drank Yorkshire bit of beer. And so they wanted, because of the punk thing going on, to attract younger people. And they said, we want to do, can you do a punk dog? I said, yeah, of course you can. You never say no. And I thought, how am I going to do that? And I tested out... Um, some sort of, you know, egg white sugar and water on my dog, Crimper, his name was, he's a cross collie. And that seemed to work. And so I, I made a little hairpiece, you know? And this dog just sat there and let me do it. But the girls in it and the boys, uh, the, the punk boy, um, the, the girls I did the real way with sugar and water. So he looks very raw, yeah? Um, and the boy, I got a beautiful, real mohawk made. It cost 500 pounds in those days, hand knotted. So that was really beautiful hair. But the girls I did with sugar and water, and, and you really have to do it the way they did their hair to make it look real. You can't do a glam version. So, and I got famous for doing that. So I did dozens of TV commercials. Um, and it was, I was very successful in that era. But what it was, um, uh, the reason I was very, very busy doing freelance work is because um, I could do every, anything really with hair, you know, from punks to glam to this to that and that's the art of doing hair for film is to be able to do period hair with hair today hair tomorrow whatever and it really looks like it's growing out of their heads not just their hair piece so this is my interpretation of my punk hairstyle you can see she's got a step bob 
tight graduation on the underneath and I cut channels through the hairstyle shorter channels and longer channels and you can see the longer channels are blue so it created these really extreme layers which I think are very very cool and gives a lot of interest and I think it's so important to take a modern interpretation and do something more fun with it so Nicholas I want to know how did you make the punk's hair stand on end well, just with, just with a blow dryer, you could hold it up and you could just dry it and just stand up straight, you know, because we didn't really have any, you know, flat irons as such in those days. So, you know, you could do like I do today, like a blade of grass thing, you know, with, with the hairspray and that. So uh, it was it was quite a tough thing, really. Uh, I did it mainly with wigs, you know, so I didn't really have to suffer the anxiety with a model or anything. But, um, you know, it was, it was very, very strong. I did another one, which is the Nat West commercial, uh, with Adrian Edmondson, and that was really raw punks. And, you know, uh, and I found out how to do it because I, I actually had to go down the King's Road on a Saturday and find some guys. Well, how the hell do you do that hair? You know, and they were very cool. They said, oh, this is how we do it, sugar and water. You do this and you do that. It's easy because they didn't have any money for gels or any products. So we've looked at the inspiration of Sassoon's and the geometry of the 1960s. We also have moving into the 70s, the tie-dye, the hippie, and again, this is my interpretation to bring it into today, to do cute little top knots with this just lovely, very relaxed chignon, again, working with the tie-dye color concept, which makes it look modern today. So you can see it's all been done before. So are you ready, Nick? Let's jump into action. Yeah, yeah, I am. But one, one thing, I would say to finalize about 60s and 70s, I just remember something that a friend of mine said, I got this great new hair color. And what he did, he, he got these models and we went to his apartment on Wednesday nights to practice doing different things. And what he did was to get bleach the girl's hair up or lift the hair up, as we say today. In those days, it's a rubber you bleach, you know? Um, and uh, he used food coloring in the hair which was extraordinary. So he got these very bright colors. And that, that's when the glam, you know, punk thing sort of happened, I think. It was really creating late 60s. Anyway, let's get down to demonstrating. So are you on first? Am I on first? Or we we'll do it together. Do it together. Hmm? Yes, go for it. So share, share what you're going to do. Well, what I'm going to do basically is, let me see if I can get her up here or I'll get the camera down a bit. Um, what I'm going to do is just dress out these rag sets, because I think that's sort of important to show you the difference. And um, and, and the interesting thing is, in, in those days, you didn't have the products like you've got now. So basically, I set this in, in, in rags, and I'm going, to keep, I'm going to brush it out with a large comb to get the texture. And the other thing we used to do, which sounds crazy, we used to actually damp the hair down with a spray of water, so it really looked very, very, very natural, yeah? So, it, it, so they did look like hippies, you know, and then we sew something into the hair or something like that. So I'm going to carry on with that. I'm going to start combing out. I'm going to use a very large tooth comb on the hair and put the hair back and really start everything underneath, which is the most important thing. And you'll find at the end of the day, we're going to get this really sort of 70s texture and I might just pop the hair up and wrap it in something like, you know, they tended to wrap their hair in, in braids or something like that, really cool, you know, just to give it a, a different feel. But it was very textured. It wasn't all shiny and everything. They didn't really like shine because, you know, the most important thing to remember is that um, hair is rather like a, a wall, you know, where you have gloss, semi-gloss, matte, you can have, um, and different kinds of textures. And a lot of these girls liked it to be very, very textured, and very, very, you know, a different kind of feel, which was almost revolutionary as well, because they didn't want to look like their mothers, basically. And I always used to say that, and people never really understood it, but they were very, very traditional, generally, depending on what level they were, because it was still middle class. You can see that, it's almost like a 20s thing going. It was middle class, and it was like the other class, you know? So it was a different kind of uh, feel. For different people you can see how this is sort of exploding into this very sort of sexy sort of look you know and we did all kinds of things in the 70s you know like this especially at molten brown because everybody went out 
like they'd done their own hair, but beautifully. It wasn't, you know, over, you know, they hardly ever used any hairspray at Morton Brown. It was also all very, very natural and very, very cool looks, you know, and it was all the beauty of who was sitting in your chair, really, you know, and how you, you dealt with it to get that lovely sort of sexy textured look. So we're going to work on this, Rivian. Um, I'll keep working on this. And are you going to do something while I do this or we're going to do it separately? No, I'm going. I'm just enjoying watching you work, actually. So I'm going to do a punk-inspired hairstyle, very much inspired by my dear friend Danilo, who does Gwen Stefani's hair. I think he's a genius, and if you're watching, I love you. So this is a forward look as to where I'm going with my particular hairstyle. Over to you, Nick. Yeah, I mean that's fantastic. I mean, you know, Danilo to me is is amazingly inspirational one. I mean, I go as far back as when I first noticed Danilo's work is when he made the hair look like an absolute vodka bottle, which I thought was brilliant, okay? Yeah. And I thought, who's this guy? Because I always used to have to create all these, you know, the hair in the shape of a bird, a tap, a cactus for these TV commercials. And, you know, um, I did a car speaker somehow, so a big sound speaker once. And I thought, ooh, how, you know, and... And when I see hairdressers like that, and I see that Gwen's hair just stands out from everybody, it's just beautiful, you know? And I think beauty is something that's very lacking in the industry at the moment. And I love to see, you know, the artistry and the beauty of hair, and also the balance, proportion, the shape um, is fantastic. It can be a simple ponytail, but it's got to look gorgeous and out of this world. And I think that's what, um, Danilo's work is about, and I think we can all learn from that as well, that it's very unique. As you can see, I've taken a faux hawk section, and I have my braids running through the sides, and it is a three-strand braid taken backwards, and I take over and over, but I only add on one side, which is really important, which makes the braid stand on its side. On this side, I did the same thing, and you can see I've created this ribbing effect, which is really kind of cool. Um, I also did set the hair just at the root to give some root lift and give me some volume. So now I'm going to back comb through here, and then what I'm going to do is use one of my little tools. This is the wefting that I'm going to use uh, for my ponytail. And um, I think it's gonna be really fabulous. So Nick, I would love to explore a little bit more about life as a hairdresser in the 60s and 70s. So do share with us. Well, I, you know, it was, it was incredible really, because, um, you know, you didn't know what to expect. And everybody did crazy things, you know, like if we went to a party and there's loads of parties and people running around and whatever, um, everybody had to go with a look and to try and outdo everybody else, you know? And um, and I thought that was fabulous, you know? We used to, we used to buy clothes that we couldn't possibly afford and go there and if you had girlfriends, we used to take girlfriends, spend hours doing their hair and, and, and doing something really quite different, you know? And, um, and I, I think that was really cool. You know, my brother was a, uh, my late brother was a great artist, great painter, and he always had fantastic ideas as, as to what to do, you know? Um, and I learned a lot from him, but it, it, you know, it, it was fantastic, you know? And you, you met people in restaurants. I remember going, um, and I, I bought a shirt, I had it made specially um, in this wonderful store in German Street. Um, and I remember I was going out with a ballet dancer and I went to this restaurant in the King's Road and there was only three of these shirts made. and Guess what? You know, the man sitting opposite us um, had one of the shirts on that they were handmade in this store, and his name was Nuriev, famous oh, dancer. Yeah. I did well then because I had the other shirt and said, What are you doing? I said, Well, you know, this is the shirt that I've had made, you know, and, and it, it, you know, and it was just all these, it, you saw famous people coming to London, there's a restaurant in the King's Road on the rooftop and at the weekends, all the Hollywood people came to London, Vivian, to be seen in the London scene, if you will, um, which was incredible. And um, so you saw all these, you know, Sammy Davis Juniors and you saw, 
you know, Michael Caine up there, and you saw when he was when they were relatively young, and all these famous people all sitting in this restaurant, you know, and um, it was crazy. So the King's Road was a place to go to in the 60s because there was like a parade of amazing cars with people sitting on top of them, and God knows what, because it, there was something happening. There was an energy. There was It was a totally different experience because it was new. It was fresh and never been seen before. And to that point, you know, um, don't do crazy things for the sake of it, but it'd be nice to see things that are original, you know, as opposed to being me too. And that's why I, you know, and also it can be simple, it can be beautiful, um, but it, it's got to be original. And I think that's very, very important that we try to see different things, but at the same time, keeping it fresh. You know, it's like what you're doing there is beautiful using added hair, but it's very fresh. What I'm doing here is more of a, sort of textures for a hippie thing. You notice I'm leaving the sides here out on the side. So I'm gonna lift her up a bit. You can see how I'm just dragging the hair back. And this was a real sort of, this is a real look of the time, you know, when the yeah. hair on the sides here and the back. But I hopefully I'm gonna make it look a little bit more modern. Um, and I think it's just, you know, do a simple thing well rather than a complicated thing badly is not a bad thing to really pursue. And yeah. I think too many young hairdressers um, really try too hard, bless them, because they're trying to do something amazing. Yes. Um, and one point I'd like to make is, you know, let's see the faces of the mannequins, not just the backs of the heads, you know, um, because I think it's all about the personality. Like Vidal was saying earlier, it's all about the bone structure and, and the balance, proportion, and shape you create for that. It might be a mannequin, but it's, it's a person, you know? I, I think that's so important. And, you know, learn from the silhouettes, just just the piece of hair at the sides here, um, I'm going to braid and do something different with, but it, it, you know, that's indicative of the period. So like you said, we can learn from the past and really bring it to the future. And I think that's so, so important that we do that. Um, and let, let the world know that hairdressers, like you say, I'm not just a hairdresser, I'm an artist. I create, I develop, I move forwards. I'm never tired of what I'm doing. And I think that's the important thing if you have clients sitting in a chair, that they've got to understand that, you know, you're on the moment, you're on trend, but at the same time, you're very respective of how they feel about themselves and who they are. As my dad said, you know, if you understand the inside of the head, um, you have a chance of getting the outside right. And I think that's so cool, you know? Um, yeah, absolutely. So how was it when you were at the Zoom, coming from your father's classic training and having to retrain because that's a good message to share with our friends today yeah because i arrived at Sassoon's with a six inch pair of shears scissors <laughs> and they sort of threw them in a bin and gave me a tiny little pair and so that's how you get that's how i had to really rethink everything that my dad had taught me but i put it in the back burner so i could bring it out and use it one day um and but i, I just completely started afresh and because my father wouldn't speak to me, um, you know, for three and a half years, I, I had to work at night in a Russian restaurant, washing up um, to pay for a little room with a shared bathroom so I could really develop my new techniques with Vidal because they wouldn't, they, he would never speak to me. He was so upset I left. But, oh. You know, the prodigal son returned later, <laughs> you know, but it was one of those things. So. But I, you know, I went through this really hard time, but it was, it was so exciting in the salon in those days. It was like theater, Vivian, which is very rare today, you know? Um, yes. To yeah. see theater, and you know what I mean? You felt, wow, you know, this is all going on. I'm holding the hair while Vidal cuts it, you know? And I thought, well, that was really cool. But I had to know all the sections for each haircut, you know? Um, yes. That was interesting in itself. And, there were so many things that we did which were crazy, you know, um, which I loved. And, um, and I, I, I think that was really an interesting sort of period. So let me talk to you about what I'm doing here. You can see I have my uh, faux hawk established. I'm using my needles to sew uh, the hair through, which is really a nice way of just twisting the hair internally, inside and outside, to create this nice texture. 
Um, the combs there are nice there, but giving that sort of indentation. Now I'm going to pull the hair apart to create even more dimension to this hairstyle. And uh, you can see just opening it and just making it more relaxed. And this is really a very important part of this hairstyle, just to sort of deconstruct it. And as I mentioned, I'm doing pretty punk. Uh, and it just definitely has a tribal vibe to it, which I really enjoy. And of course, the blonde hair is amazing, isn't it? So now what we're going to do is work on taking this skinny piece of hair that doesn't look so special and I'm going to add a weft. Now there are many ways to add wefts but what I'm going to do is do a two strand braid and I'm going to do a fishtail braid and just take the hair over from the outside into the other side and then change hands and then over and then into the other side and change hands. And I'm gonna do this for about an inch and a half. And what this is, is the base for the wefting. Now sometimes, um, as you will discover, if you take my ponytail course, I go into how to work with hair pieces and hair extensions so that it looks as though the hair's growing out of the head. Sometimes if you just simply wrap the hair around the ponytail itself, it ends up being too fat. So the method that I'm going to show you now, I really, really love because it's a, just a wonderful way of it making it look more natural and you can really add a lot more length. So anyway, let's go over to Nick because he's been telling some really cool stories and I'm dying to hear some more. Yeah, I mean, she was, she was amazing. Um, and, and she was a little bit avant-garde. But the thing is, we had to really, um, when we put tiaras on and things, it was very much traditional sort of hair. Um, I, I wasn't really a long hairdresser then at all. And um, so uh, a friend, I went to a salon called Derek Rowe, um, and they taught me how to do dress work, really, because I didn't know how to do it, you know, in 69. I was more of a hair cutter, right? Um, and then... They showed me one hairstyle. So I went to Kensington Palace to do her hair a couple of times, and I went to her home a couple more times. And she was, you know, uh, married at the time as well. And so it, it was a very interesting development because um, after about a month, I went three or four times a week. She said, why is one only got one hairstyle on one's head? And I said, well, because I only know one hairstyle. So I had to start learning other hairstyles and friends taught me how to do long hair, believe it or not. And I went back with different looks every week and, um, and different tiaras because they were very boring. So we started to do quite nice and creative things. And I think that was a great opportunity to be under that pressure. So I had to do learn dress work. I had to learn how to handle and arrange long hair, which was um, something that I was terrified of doing, Vivian. Because I was yeah. a hairdresser from Sassoon's when I went to Derrick Row, and uh, which was a much more of a glamorous sort of kind of um, salon, and it was, it was very interesting period because I was forced into doing dress work to make a living basically, and um, and then I fell in love with long hair, you know, and that's and that's what happened. So why did you leave Sassoon's? Sorry. Why did you leave Sassoon's? Well, I left Sassoon's and I went to Toronto with um, a guy called um, Michael Lewis, who wanted to work in a salon called Bruce of Crescendo. So uh, in Toronto, in the Dominion Tower, and there was only one Dominion Tower in those days. So I went there briefly. Um, I, I came back and I worked for my dad for a little bit. And then I thought, ooh, this is not going too well. So um, a girlfriend of mine, Ingrid Cleave, one of the great long hairdressers um, I've ever seen. And she came from Carita in Paris and she was at Derrick Rowe. So she said, Nicholas, you need to come to Derrick Rowe because we do some of the oldest families in England, like the Cecils, like the Keswick's. Um, and they're all, you know, all famous old families like Lady Di's mother used to go there. I used to do her hair, you know, she had ringlets at the side and a couple of hair pieces. Um, so I had to learn how to dress hair because I was a hair cutter. Of course, all the daughters came to me have their hair cut, the trendy haircuts. So that was good for Derek Rowe, who was a Canadian who came to London with Elizabeth Arden. So he had great taste. And so that's how really um, it, all, it all started. And after, after Derek Rowe, I went uh, to America to a 
to the first unisex salon called Blood, Sweat and Scissors in Atlanta. And I worked there for a year and a half. And then I came back and worked for Morton Brown. And then I went on my thing, really. So, you know, it, it, it was Glenn B and goodness knows who. So I, worked, I was very diversified, which really helped my career. So I could work uh, for anybody, really. So that was, that was the exciting part about it. But you learn different techniques from different salons because Derek Rowe had a specific technique of how to blow dry the hair, how to set it with the end in mind. And it was really quite interesting uh, experience. And, and the learning curve was amazing. So do you feel that by moving around the way that you did, it, it really opened your mind to, to be able to go into film? advertising, yeah. uh, et cetera. Yeah, because you know, when you're doing something and it's all about solutions doing hair, um, you know, how do we overcome this problem or how, do we, how can we make the hair do what we want it to do? Um, and I think that's, that's really what it's about, you know? Um, it, it's like I worked with a wonderful director called Ken Loach, um, who did a, a film called Cares, amazing film. And he said, I hate hairdressers. This is a 1950s period television commercial. And they've got to look like, you know, a very poor people in the 50s in Northern England. And they wouldn't be doing their hair or having their hair done, you know? So I actually did the television commercial. He said, that's the best hairdressing I've ever seen. How did you do it? And I said, I didn't, they did, because they did their own hair, right? I didn't touch it. I didn't take a, a comb, brush, and nothing. I said, do your own hair, and I directed them. So it all made sense in the, in the you know, in the, in, in the light of it. It was a black and white TV commercial from the 50s with a poor family. And it was really, it was really, you know, learning how to really do hair for what people want. And then other things were like, you know, I want to do very glamorous hair. I want to do this. I want to do that. And how to put tiaras on, how to sew the tiara into the braid on the head for security reasons. There's all kinds of different things that one would be, you know, one had to overcome, you know, to put the hair up like, you know, French pleats and things and make hairpins disappear. Well, there's thousands of things that you learn along the way, you know. Um, I mean, I did the first Cosmopolitan cover I did, the makeup artist showed me how to make a hairpin disappear by putting a hairpin in backwards. Yeah. So amazing. So, you yeah. know, but the thing is to really listen be humble, don't get upset if you get criticized. Um, and, and that's the way to really learn in this industry, you know, the solutions to everything. I mean, it's, it's a fantastic business because you're never bored because there's always a challenge, isn't there, Vivian? You know? yeah. So out of all the different uh, arenas you've worked in, from film, television, theater, salon, teaching, which do you find the most difficult? Um, gosh, I, I think that, the most difficult thing was um, continuity to do, like it, it, even if you're doing a TV commercial, it might be 10 days long um, to shoot it. Uh, and also you, you've got to keep the hair exactly the same every day. Otherwise you can see the hair changing, you know? Yeah. Um, and when they edit, and it's the same for film when they edit, you have to really, um, in, in the days I started, they took sort of Polaroids. They couldn't really replay it that much. You saw, um, what you saw basically was the rushes, which was film being replayed in the morning before you shot that day, if you did film, anything on film. Um, my first television commercial was the Campari ad uh, for the cinema. And I went to rushes at 5 a.m., and they said, where's the hairdresser? So I went down to the front of this showing room and I was really embarrassed. And the director said, the hair looks terrible. Don't you understand? This head will be five foot wide on the screen. I thought, oh my God. And he was so right. And I said, I'm really sorry. But he said, how long have you been doing hair for film I'm talking about? And I looked at my watch. And I said, one day in 27 minutes. So here you can see I've uh, finished my hairstyle. So some finishing touches now to just spray the hair and get a little bit more dimension. And uh, it really has a kind of a fun play that the black accessories, I think, make a bold statement. And you can see it just really works very, very nicely. So what I've done here, so that 
sort of 70s shape. I left the sides out here and I'm, I'm just braided the hair and I twisted it different ways so I don't get a baggy nape of any kind. And then I'm just using a, a decoration. So for a photographic shoot or anything, I would actually just use it to give a lot of texture to make it look very fresh and very modern, okay? So photographically, I'll do this, or for a special event, I'll do this with these porcupine quills, but short ones, not long. So it looks very sort of um, textured and strong and streety and almost like a sort of neo-punk sort of way, but with a classical twist. So I think it's really important, you know, to make it look fresh and make it look modern, especially if you're going to do like a runway show or something like that, and have everybody with the same sort of silhouettes, but not just the ponytail. So that's basically what I'm doing. A few more, and I'm going to finish up. Because um, I think that all these periods are very, very inspirational. You know, I love what Vivian's doing there, which is just stab myself. <laughs> And uh, it's rather sharp, okay? And I think it's very inspirational. And everything comes, everything comes from those periods, the 60s and the 70s, and with a hint of the 50s, but really 60s, 70s, it really grows into the 80s and the 90s, and we've never really left those periods. It's just the products have changed, uh, techniques have changed to a degree, so it, it gives it a fresh new look. We'll take these out, and we'll put a couple more at the bottom here. And then we're done. Thanks. Yes. I'm just going to do down the front a little bit through here. And then that's it. So we're just going to do a couple more through here. Just give it a more of a, so it's suddenly turned into this sort of almost tribal feel in the hair, which is cool. And then at the end, just photographically, it would look really nice and just add some bone in there. So what we've got, if I can just hold that up, can I see? Yeah. So from something very simple and rather a bland hair color, actually, um, I've got this look that's quite sort of strong looking, almost porcupine looking, which is interesting. So we've got the hair going back, we've got the two sides that we just let drop down into a braid, um, and then what we could actually incorporate that in, but I'd rather write them down. Um, and then I've just basically used braiding, deconstructed braiding at the back to really get the silhouette going, which I think is the important thing is the silhouette. It's what you see from all the different angles. You know, it's like clients always look in the mirror, they see the faces, but we don't. We see everything from a different angle and a different look and from where they're coming from and where they're going to. Does that make sense? Can you see that, Viv? That looks beautiful. Yeah. So I mean, I'd, I'd like to just summarize mine, if I may. Yeah, it's beautiful. I love the color, it's insane. <laughs> beautiful color. Right, that, you see, the thing is, um, it's all about balance, proportion, and shape. And you've got the amazing sides, which I really love, which you pre-did in those braids and hangs out, and it's loose. So you have that solid, you know, solidarity through the middle. And then you have this wonderful uh, piece that you just popped on. But what I love about it, you've left it very loose and very fresh. And that's really the look of today, isn't it? You can see that on Gwen Stavani on The Voice, looking insanely beautiful. So here you can see uh, my finished look is definitely sporting tribal with glamour. And uh, yes, the inspiration is punk. And Trevor Sorby always used to say to me, Viv, when you take an idea, don't carbon copy the idea. Disguise the idea so that people can't see the original source of where the inspiration came from. That way it'll be always be more original. So I hope that makes sense. I hope you've enjoyed this journey down memory lane where we have honored the life and the work of Freddie French, told the story from building an empire from nothing and sadly the fall of an empire, but the birth of his amazing son, Nicholas French and the incredible work that Nicholas has done throughout his career, which is truly an inspiration. And I know dad looking down will love it, every minute of it, it was really, you know, his inspiration to see hairdressers working on, you know, TV and everything else. And, and he was there at the beginning. So I'm sure he's looking down thinking, wow, that's wonderful. So it's <laughs> an honor and a pleasure to be wow. here working with all of you. And, you know, if, if, like I always say, Vivian, you know, if it's in your heart, it'll be in your hands. It's all about, you know, progressing. And, you know, we have bad days, we have good days, but 
you know, tomorrow's the future and tomorrow's another opportunity to do something different with your careers, especially now. And, you know, and to really, you know, hope is a good thing. Um, and it's the best of things, really. And, and good things never really die. They move forwards. Great words of wisdom from our master. So now check out a retrospective of some of my work starting in the 80s through to today. Thank you for watching. We'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.